Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Denise Mananis. I'm the uh, AVP for External Affairs for St. John's Riverside Hospital, and I'd like to thank you for joining us today in the next of our series of educational webinars. This one on chronic pain, a talk with one of our pain specialists. Uh, so before we begin, I'd like to first thank our team for putting together these uh, programs. That's Jason Latour, our media production manager who serves as our producer, Nancy Nabi, our community liaison, and Candace Cousins Hopkins, who is our associate director of external affairs. Uh, also, I'd like to thank our community partners who help us get the word out about all of these programs. Uh, the first, Sally Pinto, who is from the Yonkers Neighborhood Naturally Occurring Retirement Community, which is under the umbrella of the Yonkers Office for the Aging and Westchester Jewish Community Services. Also, Z Baird, who is from the Yonkers Public Library, uh, who has uh, three locations, Riverfront, Will, and Crestwood. And actually, uh, this topic was a suggestion from Z, so we thank her for her input, and we hope that we're helping to meet some of the needs of her constituents. Uh, so today, we brought our great Dr. Stephen Arosa to uh, speak with us about pain. And uh, before we begin, I just wanted to let everyone know that if you are, if you have questions, feel free to put them into our Q&A. And at the end of the program, uh, ha if we have not answered those questions, we'd be happy to ask them. So Dr. Steven Arosa is a dual board certified pain physician who focuses on rehabilitation and advanced interventions to help manage chronic pain. He graduated from the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine and completed his residency program and fellowship at Montefiore Medical Center. He is currently practicing at St. John's Medical Group at the Boyce Thompson Center in Yonkers. And he is a dedicated physician who aims to provide treatments for his patients that have long lasting effects. And actually, I do know that for a fact because almost everyone I know goes to see Dr. Rosa. So doctor, thank you for being with us and taking time out of your busy day. We appreciate you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. <laughs> Absolutely. So why don't we jump right in and we can start first. You know, people use the word pain. A lot. Right. And so maybe you could start with a definition of pain and then what is pain management? Absolutely. So the medical definition of pain is actually very telling. So then I'm just going to actually read it straight to you so you can hear it and I'll break it down so that you understand. Pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. So what does that mean? Pain is a complex issue. It is an experience that we as individuals have in regards to an injury or a perceived injury. And the way we process that information, that sensation, uh, relies on a multitude of factors. So when we talk about it, it's the biology, the body, could be actually injured or maybe injured, and we're feeling pain in that area. Uh, psychologically, the experience, how we're processing the, the emotional state also affects how that is. And then the other aspects of social issues uh, in our communities and our support groups um, uh, in regards to the conditions or stressors that we're feeling. So pain is a little bit complicated um, and it's actually an experience of a situation. And so we can break that down and, and, and talk about that uh, a little bit further throughout the talk. OK. And, mm -hmm. So can you can you give me different? So you, you said physical and emotional, um, but in from a medical point of view, when someone is sitting at home, they're experiencing, let's say, a physical pain. Is that what kind of pain are we talking about? Nerve pain? pelvic pain what what else would so yes so that's uh, and that's the thing it, all of these things play a role so mm -hmm. neuropathic pain or nerve pain the tingling the burning sensations um joint related pains uh arthritic pains pain from the back the neck uh chronic pelvic or abdominal pain patients that have had surgeries and afterwards everything is fixed there's nothing more to do 
but they suffer from pain. So when you're in your home and you have any of these things sound familiar, these are conditions that a pain specialist can address. Um, and to sort of just piggy go circle back on, you know, what is pain management? Pain management is a multidisciplinary field in and of itself. And because of how pain is an emotional experience as well as a physical experience and has both of those um, components, when I see patients and work with them, we are looking at the biological, the actual tissue injury, nerve injury, arthritic joint, but we're also talking about how patients can help themselves with therapeutic activities, with stress reduction, with other social support, um, uh, uh, social support um, recommendations. And then when we talk about this, you may find uh, a referral. Some patients may benefit from psychology or psychiatry help or things of that nature. So um, a lot of this is uh, multidisciplinary in a sense. So that sort of leads me into my next question, which is um, your approach. It sounds uh, holistic, which is probably the wrong word to use in a in a medical environment, but you're looking at the whole person rather. So the question is, why is your approach different from other specialists who also will treat pain? And and then therefore, why should someone come to you? So the uh, the perspective of an of a pain physician or an interventional pain physician uh, is someone is uh, where where we enter in the continuum of your treatment is either before or after having some sort of uh, intervention whether it's surgery or medically. Um, so when someone has seen a physician, let's say they've gone to their primary, they've gone to a orthopedic specialist, they've gone to a neurology specialist, they've seen a neurosurgeon, uh, they've seen a rheumatologist, they've been given oral medications, they've tried a surgery, uh, they've done uh, 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 several other conservative treatments, maybe even therapy for a pain condition, um, and they're not getting much better, or they've improved, but they still have some pain. A lot of times, if you can live with it, we usually say, live with it. You can manage your pain if you're, you're your, let's just use a knee replacement as an example. Your knee is moving, it is functioning well, um, but it doesn't feel right. It feels heavy, it feels achy, it feels burning, and you've tried therapy. A lot of times your physicians will say, well, this is, this is what it's gonna be, there's nothing more to do. And that may not be the, the whole answer. There may be other things that you can do, and there are at least five other things after surgery that I can talk about um, that can be done for managing that type of chronic pain, whether it's from a nerve, from a joint, or from the muscles, there are things that can be done. And that's when you would see a, a pain specialist. Okay, so can you walk us through the process uh, for a typical patient? What What happens? How do we how do we access you and what's the process once we get in front of you? Absolutely. So obviously it's just like any other physician, you make an appointment. At the first visit, there's gonna be a full workup and exam. So anything, whatever the condition is that you're suffering from, whatever painful condition, if it's uh, diabetic neuropathy, if it's uh, chronic pelvic pain or chronic post joint pain, shoulders, necks, back, whatever it is, Whatever you've done to date would be helpful to know, whether that's therapy or surgeries for that condition. And then during that visit, in addition to the physical exam, listening to you, because that's one of the most important things, listening to our patients is key. What you're experiencing matters as to what type of pain and where it's coming from. I may recommend a nerve test. I may recommend x-rays or MRIs to assess that area and see what's going on. Um, and that, that visit, we would discuss uh, any medications that you may have not tried uh, specific for that type of pain. Uh, we may discuss trialing some more therapy. It all depends on what you've done. But then once that's finished and we have a plan, we can discuss 
uh, potential interventions, whether they're going to be minimally invasive procedures that can really target the source of your pain, or if they're going to be more conservative, um, holistic or complementary approaches, uh, such as physical therapies or um, classes of medications that can help with chronic pain that are not addictive and that are safe to take, um, and maybe a referral to a different specialist you might have not seen before. So this is a, it's a very important meeting, sitting down together to get the whole workup right. done so that we can tailor a personalized treatment plan for you. Okay, so you mentioned the five interventions, the five, the five things that you can do uh, oh. to help people what let's let's talk about those sure so let's just uh, take a look at and just using that as an example with the the, the post knee replacement um when i i'm going to mention some interventions they actually can be applied to uh various areas of the body not just the knee but these are the different types of procedures so many patients have had cortisone injections uh, to nerves, to joints, into muscles um, from other providers if they've had these chronic conditions. Um, those are things that we can do as well, uh, but there are things called nerve blocks, um, both uh, in the spine and outside of the spine around the joint that we do under ultrasound guidance. There are nerve ablations where we knock out that nerve so that you don't feel it for about nine months to a year. That sensory nerve is no longer transmitting that signal to your perception. So let me just um, ask a question about that. Um, if you do a nerve ablation, does that mean it lasts for nine months, but it, come, it can come back? Yes. So uh. nothing we do is permanent because we're not killing that nerve. We are stunning it. It is a pain management modality, so it can be easily repeated, um, and it's not going to cause you any long-term um, dysfunction or or harm or long-term uh, effects, which is a good thing because the things that we do, we may want to do uh, something else down the line depending on how well you're feeling. And that kind of leads me to something else that, that we're doing at St. John's that's actually been very beneficial and very helpful, and I've utilized for my own family members um, is peripheral nerve stimulation. The other end of that coin is instead of disconnecting the signal, we can alter it and change the signal that you're feeling by stimulating those nerves with a very gentle, comfortable sensation to sort of reprogram and stop that pain from its source, the neck, the back, the knee, whether you had surgery or not. And that is the key so is that some, uh, some you... patients will benefit from this after not having had a surgery, they could use this as a complementary or alternative. Right. So, so can you talk a little bit about that peripheral nerve stimulation? What, what is that? How does that happen? So um, under ultrasound guidance, we can place a needle next to a given nerve, to the foot, to the knee, to the neck, to the back, and stimulate that nerve, giving it a positive uh, painless or um, comfortable sensation. And I leave that little wire under the skin. There's no cutting, no incisions, no sutures, and nothing's permanent. It stays there for two months, treating the area of pain. And then after two months, I take it out. And those patients can have up to a year of benefit. So now, I just to kind of continue with that line of logic, what if it comes back? What if you felt great for five months? What's the next step? What can I do? Well, we can actually place a little wire the same exact way and leave it under the skin and give you an on off button for your pain that you could use for the rest Ever. of your life. So so is that done the same way under with ultrasound guidance? And is that where is that done in your office, in the hospital? How is that handled? So all of these types of uh, procedures to manage chronic conditions, these chronic pain conditions are done in the hospital, mainly because I have the equipment necessary to do them here. Um, there are some I use x-ray guidance for to take an x-ray to see where I'm placing either a needle or one of my instruments. Uh, and other ones we use the ultrasound like I mentioned before. And they're same day ambulatory treatments. So you come in and you walk out the ones I just mentioned are done under local anesthetic. There's no general sedation, no uh, twilight sedation, and patients tolerate it very well. 
and they're very happy to be able to go home within a few hours. So that's that was my question. How long are they actually here for when they come in, they register, they they go in to see you and they're so in and turnaround time is what, two hours? Yeah, yep. Yeah, two, two to three hours, Great. depending at the end of it all, you get a coffee and a cake. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so we went through nerve blocks, nerve ablation, the peripheral nerve stimulation, and then uh, which is either temporary and or you can be permanent with an on off button. Is, is there another you have other possible interventions? Yeah, so those are some of the more the 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 least invasive, more peripheral things that we do. There are options. Let's say you happen to have had a spine surgery for anything. It doesn't matter what type of condition and you continually have pains in your back and continue have pains in your legs. Aside from injection treatments, medicines and exercise, there are a couple other types of neurostimulators that we place in the back and those are a trial for seven days. You try them for seven. If they change your pain drastically and you're sleeping better and walking better, then that would get also permanently placed as a more of a central stimulation for the legs or for the arms. Um, that's along the lines of what we call stimulation or neuromodulation is that term. Um, and we can do that for chronic pelvic abdominal pain, which wow. is a little bit different and unique. Post uh, abdominal surgery like hernia repairs. Some people are walking around with hernia repair uh, repairs that are functioning great. They don't have a hernia anymore, but their groin and their abdomen are hurting all the time and they're getting electrical stimulation. Uh, electrical, uh, we call paresthesias or tingling and burning into the groin, into their genitals. And we have great treatments for that along the lines of the spinal stimulation. Wow. Okay, so you have a lot of tools to to attempt to help people with all of their issues. Um, do you think that these all these interventions meet the patient's expectations? Are they are they relieving pain at 50 percent, 75 percent, 100 percent? What's the what's the average there? So when we talk about pain interventions, we talk about 50 percent being the gold standard of success. That's what the FDA will approve a given treatment or procedure for. That being said, I get more than that more often than not, but I never promise 100% pain relief. This is pain management. So if we can get you functioning better, being able to do more in your house or with your family and friends, that's our goal. If we get 100, yeah, I, I get 100. But that depends. So I like to set up reasonable expectations with my patients that we are going to try these interventions. And like I had mentioned earlier about how many things we have for one given problem, we start off with the least invasive and then we move up. And everything I do is minimally invasive. So at the end of it all, we have several tries before we can find something that really helps you. And that's my promise. If we're going to do something to get you feeling better, and if we cannot, then we'll get you to somebody who can. But um, yeah, this is uh, it's a great field. Uh, we have a lot of alternative options that mm, many of our uh, uh, our colleagues are unaware of that we offer these things. And so this is a, a good sort of um, uh, talk to have with our community to see that if you've been seeing somebody for a while and you're still having discomfort in a given area and they don't have more to offer, this is the field that you might find some relief in. So you talked about all of those interventions being minimally invasive, starting with the least minimally, working your way up through all of these um, opportunities to help. What are the risks associated when you get to the implant pieces? Um, they don't seem like they're within your body very much. I mean, what are the what what's the common risks for it? So like any other um, injection or needle procedure, there's always risks of infection. There's risks of bleeding, uh, risks of damage to those nerves. But we minimize all of those risks. So like I mentioned earlier, I'm ultrasound guiding a lot of these things and I'm X-ray guiding them so I can see where I'm going, what I'm going through and avoiding anything that I don't want to hit. So we minimize all of those risks. In certain instances, patients that are on blood thinners 
for conditions that are dangerous, atrial fibrillation, which can cause stroke, blood clots that can cause massive clots to the lungs. They have to be on these medicines. They don't have to stop them for this procedure, for some of these procedures. We can do them because we can see where we're going and minimize that. Um, infection. There's always a risk of infection. Everything we do is sterile. We never reuse any instrumentation in between patients, and we always throw out all our medications in between patients. We use sterile technique. We use sterile gloves. We're all wearing masks, um, and we minimize that risk. And then as far as damage to the ear, again, I can see where we're going. Bleeding, the bleeding risk is minimal because it's a needle. You get a Band-Aid in most cases after all these procedures to help you with your pain. Um, yeah, so, uh, so as far as risk, um, oh, an infection, let's say somebody does have an infection, um, which is very rare, uh, for the implants that I've done, I've had three out of a hundred and almost 40 or 50 cases, and they're all treated with oral antibiotics. It's usually a skin infection. Wow. So that actually sort of ties into the last question that I have, um, which is, you know, we have a large senior population. Uh, many of them have co-occurring other, you know, morbidities. You know, they have congestive heart failure, they have other heart conditions, they may have had some kind of cancer. Do any of those um, things complicate or prevent fr you from being able to use some of these modalities? It's a great question, and I will say that every case is different. The overwhelming majority of patients can still have all of these interventions despite having multiple comorbidities. In fact, in many instances, these procedures are some of the only things that they can have because they would not be able to tolerate a larger surgery. Um, right. I've done uh, minimally invasive lumbar decompression, something else we did not touch on which is a procedure where we decompress the spine, same day procedure. You go back to your normal activities in 24 hours. You don't stay at the hospital. There are no implants for the spine. There's no, in, no sutures, uh, no major surgery in the back, but can help with back and leg pain. I've done them on patients with congestive heart failure that are 90 in their 90s. I think my oldest patient was 94 years old who's done this. So these are things that can be done safely um, when other treatments are contraindicated. Well, so go back to that procedure and tell us, um, give us a little bit more of a detailed explanation of that. It's a it's lumbar decompression, but what does that really mean? Are you cleaning out the bone? Are you fusing bones? Are you what what are you are you you're um uh -huh, I think I remember this. You're creating more space around the the spinal cord. Yes, that's right. So ah. Patients that have stenosis yeah. or basically symptoms in pain in their back and legs when they stand, forcing them to sort of bend forward when they walk to alleviate it or forcing them to lean on a walker or a shopping cart when m trying to be mobile because when they stand erect, their canal tightens, it squeezes, and when they bend, it opens. There is a part of the spine that's called the ligamentum flavum. It's a ligament. It's a piece of tissue that gets really thick and big when we get older. And it's there it's to support the spine. So the spine and the body are smart, but not that smart. They strengthen <laughs> themselves and they get big and then they compress the nerve. And by compressing that nerve, you get this pain. Now, it happens mostly in our older, as we get older, and then, as you mentioned, Denise, earlier, that patients that are older sometimes have multiple comorbidities from other diff other issues, and they're not able to have, or maybe not may not want to have, a decompression surgery where you do a laminectomy or a fusion, which is very common. A lot of patients know about these types of procedures for back and leg pain. Now, let's say you're not a candidate, or you don't want to do it, and you want to seek a different option. This is something that is something that we do after an injection, if an injection doesn't help you, um, but before having an open surgery by simply shaving a little bit of that ligament out, we can open up that space and then 
you can feel better like when you're leaning forward, except when you're standing up. And the goal is to get you more functional. Patients reported uh, greater than 300% improvement in distance of walking. So from several hundred steps to a few thousand steps. Patients also reported uh, an average of uh, 50 minutes to an hour of standing time before feeling pain in their legs and an overall 50% improvement in their overall pain. Now, those patients who had this done, 95% of them in the most recent data that was collected had the same benefits at five years. Only 5% needed to have another procedure. So it's minimally invasive, very safe, um, as safe as an epidural with no major complications in any clinical trial mm. versus, you know, our statistics with other open procedures. So it's a, a logical next step, but a lot of times patients will see neuro or ortho surgery regarding this, uh, this condition. So this is something that has been out for about 15 years uh, and in Medicare for about five to 10 years. And the clinical data, that long-term data I just mentioned to you is a recent data collection. And it's so impressive. Um, it's becoming more utilized by pain specialists. So let's say someone comes and has any one of those interventions, including the, the lumbar decompression piece. Do you then recommend, um, main, I mean, how does someone maintain those benefits you know if if people have issues and and they but they really are committed to being better are there other things that you do post those procedures are you recommending other modalities to keep them moving forward and improving what you know what you've done absolutely so after this um for my very uh, Western medicine, standard medicine approach, we recommend physical therapy, and those patients continue to get better at about six months, talking about that particular procedure. Right. But all of my patients will get a recommendation to do physical therapy or some sort of home exercise program, which we also hand out information regarding that, um, to kind of talk about more things that you can do on your own. We just talked a lot about all of the, the interventions and, and treatment options that a pain specialist has to offer. Um, but the advice and recommendations for things that you can do for yourself also exist. Um, exercising, walking 30 minutes three times a week can be very helpful for your health um, and your quality of life. Uh, things like, you know, depending on your ability, and they actually have these um, uh, activities such as yoga, tai chi activities, some Zumba. Uh, there's a lot of different activities, especially for seniors, uh, that to, can help keep them mobile. And part of those activities, when we talk about the, and I don't think I use this a term, but the biopsychosocial, when we talk model of healthcare or model of pain, we talked about the biology, we talked about the psychology, we talked about the social aspect of the pain experience. And so the biopsychosocial model is to hit all of those avenues. I take care of the biology. I find ways to make the biology feel better, whether it's through medicine or through interventions, blocking or stimming nerves. But some of the other things that we need are exercise and these activities like Tai Chi, Zumba, uh, yoga, they're usually group exercises. So you get the social aspect, you get the support group aspect from it. You get the um, psychological benefit from having the camaraderie of, of being with friends and, uh, and being out. Um, so those more um, physical modalities, more social modalities can also be extremely beneficial. And after any of these procedures that get your severe chronic pain under control, we recommend that you take advantage of that pain relief and participate in these activities. Thank you, doctor. Is there anything else that you want to talk about in terms of the things that you're working on currently, or are there any futuristic things that you're looking at that you're hoping to do? What's going on out there? Um, right now, uh, there are an, other interventions on the horizon. There are a couple of things that we are uh, that we do offer that I'd like to do more of. 
Um, just, just and it and it gets into some nitty gritty of things, but back pain doesn't have to be just from the joint or from a disc or from a nerve. There actually is some evidence that the bones themselves, as they get older, where where the spine, the spine bones themselves can get inflammation. And we offer treatment here at St. John's where we can do a, an ablation of the actual bone to get that pain under control. So some patients may have seen pain specialists and they've done blocks and epidurals and they saw a surgeon. They say it's really not that bad. There's really nothing to do. But the reality is they might have this condition called vertebrogenic pain and not many specialists are offering these treatments. So if you're out there listening to this or you know a loved one who's, you know, you've heard everything I said sounds like a broken record. Yeah, he did that. He did that. He did that. You may not realize that there are other things available. And we at St. John's uh, Riverside Hospital and St. John's Riverside Medical Group are offering more interventions than most pain physicians locally and at the major academic centers. Some of the ones that I've mentioned today are not being routinely performed at the major academic centers closest to us. So it's worth uh, a conversation um, to discuss some of these things. In addition, oh, sorry, Denise, go no, ahead. No, no, you go ahead, finish, go ahead, no, in, in addition, there are some other, um, what we call restorative therapies on the market where we're, you know, using uh, electricity and devices to help restore function of muscles in the back. So from a therapeutic approach, um, sometimes the muscles in the back are weak and that's what's causing pain. That's what's causing worsening degeneration. And rather than uh, overriding the pain with a spinal stimulator or burning and ablating the pain and disconnecting the nerve with an ablation therapy, there are actually therapies that can help restore the, the natural function of your muscles in your spine and that could provide long-term relief. So I can honestly, I could talk for days on all the advanced treatments that are available. Um, and I think that's why we're here is to get the word out and spark some conversation in the community that there is more to, to do. There are more advancements available and that a pain management doctor is not somebody that's going to just cover your pain with medicine and say, that's all I can do. They actually can do things that get to the source of the problem and in many instances can fix the problem. So um, that's, that's what I have to say. That's a beautiful thing. And we re listen, we really appreciate your time. Um, maybe we'll come back in the new year because we have a few more um, webinars this year. But as you're doing more things, um, we probably want to come back and revisit this. But I thank you so very much um, for for sort of going through all of the things that you're working on. It's very exciting. I know for my family, um, my extended family, the mothers of people I work with, uh, everybody's lining up to sort of get in to see you. So uh, we really appreciate uh, hearing from you today. Um, just so that my audience knows too, that um, October 19th, we are gonna be sponsoring the Breast Cancer Awareness webinar with Dr. McAvoy and Laura Grafland. Uh, Dr. McAvoy is a breast surgeon. Uh, Laura Grafland is her nurse practitioner, and they are going to be talking about all kinds of new uh, things that they're seeing and doing uh, for women who are uh, dealing with breast cancer. Uh, but we also recently were asked to do some webinars on grief and stress. And as we are heading into the fall, into the holiday seasons, towards the end of the year, we thought that this might be a good time to address those topics as well. So please uh, look out for uh, information on both of those topics. Um, in fact, the grief one is gonna be addressed by our chaplain, Reverend uh, Paul Bryan Smith, who uh, was one of our healthcare heroes during COVID and uh, who has dealt with everyone, the patients, their families and our staff. Uh, in terms of dealing with grief and loss. And so we hope everyone will come and, and talk through uh, that, that topic with us. In the meantime, let's go to our uh, information. If anyone would like, this webinar will be on all of our social media platforms. Um, but if you'd like to see Dr. Arosa, he is located at our Boyce Thompson Pavilion, in, uh, which is on North Broadway and Executive Boulevard. His office number is 914 207 
That's Stephen Arosa at 207-0004. Also, if anyone is still, as you know, some of our COVID numbers are going up um, because people are out and doing living their lives. And if you do get COVID and you do not feel comfortable coming in, virtual urgent care is there for you, uh, 914-964-4429. Uh, and, you know, they can make a, a sound recommendation for you whether or not you need to come in or they can help you uh, over the, uh, the computer. And if you have general questions about today, uh, both of these emails come to me directly so I can respond to you. Info at riversidehealth.org. If you would like information about Dr. Arosa, that's the one to do. But also he can be found on find a doc at riversidehealth.org uh, and also our website, which is riversidehealth.org. So with that, I believe we might be done. And uh, thanks again for joining us today. Have a great afternoon, everyone.